Welcome everybody to um, this month's August's Climate in the Pub meeting, which um, once again, sadly, is, is a Zoom meeting, but the good news about that is that there's an opportunity for um, more people than would normally be able to fit into the pub to, um, uh, to hear what's going on. So there's a good side to that. Um, I should start by um, acknowledging uh, the original occupants of the lands, the various lands on which we're meeting tonight. For many of us, that's uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And um, we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And um, let's not forget that they've been stewards of this land um, for tens of thousands of years and managed it quite well. So we have a, uh, we have a good track record to follow and hope that we can manage to do that as well. Sorry, I'm just going to admit a few more people. Um, just before we get started with, with uh, David's talk on transport tonight, um, I think today of all days, it's impossible not to mention the, um, the report that was, uh, was published last night, the IPC sixth assessment report. I'm not gonna talk about that because it's all too dire. Um, what was released yesterday evening was simply the report on the science uh, from the IPCC's working group one of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So that's just the science aspect of it. It's an enormously detailed document, um, and let's not go into that tonight. Um, but what it, what it shows us is that uh, it's a red alert. It shows us that... Um, Australia has already warmed by 1.4 degrees um, since the, the records from earlier in the last century were started. Um, and our, our best target was 1.5 degrees. So we're, we're, we're virtually there. Um, Australia is slightly more warming than, than the average for the world. Um, interestingly, um, a report by Hugh Sadler, who um, addressed, who spoke to us in a Climate in the Pub meeting about a year ago here on Zoom, um, finds that Australia is, is, his phrase is lagging at the back of the pack. He says out of 23 OECD countries that he studied, we are 20th out of 23 or worse on nearly every category of performance that he looked at. And he looked at, um, that was seven out of eight of the categories he looked at, things like the emissions intensity of our industry, things like the way our share of renewable energy is increasing, and things like our per capita transport emissions. And on that point, uh, it's something that brings us directly to what we're going to hear about tonight from David Mills. Um, his talk, as you will have seen before you signed up for this, just a moment. His talk before you signed up for this, uh, you would have seen, is called Personal View of Human Transport Before 2050. And then his subheadings were on the planet, above the planet, and even off the planet. Um, I'm just going to introduce David briefly. Um, <coughs> Dr. David Mills, um, OAM was formerly a senior research fellow at the University of Sydney, where he led research and development in a number of solar thermal technologies. And he was the co-founder and chairman of OSRA Inc., which built a novel solar thermal electricity plant in California. Uh, so he's obviously a, a solar energy expert, but more recently he's turned his attention to um, EVs. Um, having bought one of the first three Teslas to be imported into Australia. So um, I hope that's going well with you, David. Um, and I'm going to throw to you now and, and ask you just to introduce your talk, and uh, then we're going to hear it. So over to David. Oh, thank you, Dominic. Uh, it was a, a kind introduction. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me first? Um, is that clear? Yes, good. Um, uh, this, uh, I was a bit terrified about the Zoom because I'd never done a Zoom presentation before. I, I, was, I expected to do a pub presentation, which uh, I have done before. <laughs> so uh, so um, uh, uh, we 
finally decided on a presentation. We could have done it the normal way, but then I, I would have fun, fumbled something and something would have gone wrong. Um, uh, but I have a wonderful technical group here. I've got two sons that both know everything about computers. And so uh, we've actually made a small movie uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, we made a, a presentation and then uh, we movied it, set it down on iMovie. Uh, and, uh, and that seems to work. It seems to do everything we want. So that's, that's, that's quite good. Um, uh, some of it, it sounds like this group will be all up on their climate uh, um, information. Uh, I've said a little bit at, at the beginning of the talk, but it doesn't last too long. So uh, uh, it's probably all obsolete from the IPCC anyway, uh, this announcement today. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, I think it's about half an hour, uh, uh, 34 minutes or something. Uh, if you uh, I, I'm not offended if you step around and some of the pages are a bit too uh, technical or whatever, if you want to walk off for a glass of wine. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, I'm happy to begin. Good evening and thank you for logging in tonight and thanks to Dominic for being my minder. Because this was my first Zoom presentation, I've re pre-recorded the commentary for safety. Uh, my field was solar power, not transport, say, uh, but they are being interlinked for good and a uh, forward look now um, for the discussion is a really good idea. I had trouble with the talk because it's such a long and big story. I experienced incredible information overload trying to be up to date because the tech seems to be uh, extremely active right now. Two areas had to be dropped. Uh, I look back on very old transport history to ancient times and transport off the planet, which had to be dropped as too long. But these are each easily big enough for another whole talk. Let's first see if we can get through this talk safely. Well, this is the gloomy bit. The Paris Accord is based on a 1.5% emissions increase, but implies an overshoot in recovery. We are less than 1.5%, some of that thanks to COVID, but the weather is already very alarming. Halting new emissions is a priority that requires wholesale changes in energy generation, transport and agriculture as fast as humanly possible. As for biodiversity, it's a mess. Humans now account for about 36% of the biomass of all remaining land mammals. Domesticated livestock account for 60%. Wild mammals, only 4%. Poultry biomass is three times the biomass of all wild birds. Insect numbers are falling rapidly. Total land plant biomass has been decreased by a factor of two since we began agriculture. Toxic chemicals and plastics are now affecting most habitats and need a new Paris-like agreement. This simple diagram comes from our former chief scientist, Alan Finkel, and very simply emphasizes that energy use makes up 73% of human caused global emissions. From the original 2016 International Energy Agency data, we find that they amount to 38% of emissions coming from power generation and 16.2% from transport. The transport component is split between road transport at 11.9% or nearly 12% and 4.3% for all the other transport, rail, air, ship, pipeline, and everything else. So 54% or roughly half of all human originated global emissions are accessible options if we use fast change, change over solar and wind electricity. However, we'll later see that air travel, though small, is a special case with a warming effect greater than carbon dioxide alone. This next section will be about changes we can make to surface transport. My wife, Karina, and I are standing next to our two fully electric cars, a 2014 Tesla and a 2015 BMW i3. The driveway is our filling station because uh, there's a little charge point behind us on the wall that can draw electricity from the house. We almost never charge up away from home, just on long trips, which are very few these days. Um, around the back are solar panels, uh, refined sunlight into electricity, 
which is fed in a declining priority to our home usage, uh, the home batteries, uh, the cars, and the grid. In the winter, we import a lot from the grid for heating, but we were about even, even in the uh, shoulder, shoulder months and have a big excess in summer. Importing one off-peak kilowatt hour at 15 cents takes Tesla about five kilometers for about three cents per kilometer. Progress in uh, electric vehicles or EVs has been very dependent on improvements in car storage batteries. In the slide, the topless car shows it's now standard EV construction using what is called the skateboard, which is a large battery pack filled with thousands of small batteries that is structurally part of the car. Uh, there is a wheel at each corner. The battery weight down low makes cars like this very stable and almost impossible to roll over. Uh, the picture in the corner shows two upcoming EVs, a second generation Tesla Roadster for the wealthy and a large semi-trailer truck cab called the Tesla Semi. The Semi will have a range of either 483 kilometers or 805 kilometers. The Roadster will have a range of 998 kilometers. Um, Tesla thinks the problems of uh, range anxiety are completely solved. This somewhat uh, busy slide describes the slightly fascinating fact that the first EV was built by a Hungarian priest, Anjos Jedlik, in 1828, but a rechargeable battery did not arrive until the lead acid battery was invented by the Frenchman Gaston Pointet in 1858. And uh, that was much improved by Camille Alphonse IV entering production for starter motors in 1886. I intend to treat the batteries this evening as uh, unfathomable magic black boxes to save time and also so I don't get any difficulty trying to explain them. Um, even for lead acid, Wikipedia says there is quantum mechanics at work. Um, uh, the bird shown is a giant species that Gaston discovered in the Paris basin as a young man who was named Gastonus parisiensis in his honor. Thomas Edison invented many things, and one of them was a nickel iron battery in 1901, after he had tried 10,000 different chemical formulations. Instead of using lead acid electrolyte, he used a strong base, potassium hydroxide. He was preceded by Waldemar Jungnerbutt, who patented it in Sweden in 1899, but it's not clear that Edison knew about that in 1901. Jungnerbutt, anyway, decided that the nickel iron was inferior to toxic nickel cadmium, which he had invented alone. But the Edison battery was in fact a practical non-toxic device. It was very reliable for use in an electric car. A friend of ours recently bought a room full of them from China to store electricity in his off-grid house. Nickel iron is probably the most dystopia-ready battery, lasting more than a century with cleaning every decade or so. This um, atmospheric photo uh, is of an electric car called the Detroit Electric, made around 1914. In production longer than any other electric car. 13,000 Detroit Electrics were built from 1907 to approximately 1939. The batteries were lead acid, but an Edison battery was a $600 option and increased range to 130 kilometers. Performance was um, sedate. Detroit electric cars were owned by both Thomas Edison and Clara Ford, wife of Henry Ford. Clara bought hers in 1914 and used it into the 1930s. Oh, like many wealthy women, she preferred it to the noisy, smelly petrol Model Ts produced in millions by her husband. Clara's car is still in fine condition uh, in a museum, and there are two examples in Australia. Those with money continued happily to buy the Detroit Edison, Edison's battery until 1939, but it was about seven to eight times the price of a Model T. These days, they cost about $200,000 at auction, more than a large Tesla. In early 1914, Ford reported to the New York Times that he and Thomas Edison 
had been working on a new low-cost electric car that would use the Edison battery. Uh, they estimated the price to be $500 to $700 in the range of 50 to 100 miles. Ford performed the engineering. Normal Model Ts were priced lower at $390 to $420. Nobody knows no, exactly what happened, but the project failed, and there was a lot of bad press loosely based on Edison's early battery, battery troubles. Uh, some believe that Ford was pressured by John Rockefeller and other oil interests to abandon the project. But it is also likely that the price point of the battery was unfavorable. Edison batteries supplied to D Detroit Electric were $600, more than the price of a new Model T. After the project failed, electric cars were seen to be outdated and most manufacturers failed in the 1920s. People were starting to get nervous about the climate in the 1980s. General Motors had tried to design an EV, but failed. So they hired Air Environment, who had designed GM's Sunracer solar car in the 1987 World Solar Challenge, which it was a Trans-Australia race for solar vehicles. The GM impact was revealed in 1990. Some thought it was badly named, but it did have a huge impact. Alan Cocconi of AC Propulsion designed and built the drive system electronics for the impact. He was able to use the inverter to create braking and uh, the regeneration of electricity to recharge the battery, as he had with the Sun Racer. It helped give the car a real life range of about 112 kilometers and very high performance. 50 handmade cars were built and leased out by GM for testing and then reclaimed and then crushed. Hmm. GM became quite good at crushing cars at later, uh, but this time it decided to make a production version called the EV1. As we will see, Cochoni's engineering would later be the inspiration for Tesla. The EV1 that ap appeared in 1996 was hugely advanced. It had uh, a heat pump uh, AC system, uh, regenerative braking, amazing aerodynamics, all things later adopted by Tesla. According to current EPA metrics, uh, the range was 89 kilometers on the lead acid battery uh, with that, and uh, 126 kilometers on the nickel metal hydride battery. About 660 uh, lead acid cars were built at Gen 1 in 1996 and 457 Gen 2 on the, uh, partly on the uh, NIMH or nickel metal hydride batteries in 1999 then production stopped. From March 2nd, 2000, about 200 of the Gen 2 cars were converted uh, to uh, nickel metal hydride on two-year lease. Um, John Goodenough was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, for his work on lithium-ion batteries, uh, along with Stanley Whittingham and Akira Kira Yoshino. Um, he is the oldest person to be awarded the Nobel Prize. He is now 99. First commercial batteries of this type were the Sony lithium cobalt oxide batteries uh, or cells, widely used for computers and mobile phones after the mid 90s. And uh, he, it, they were commercialized in vehicles by Tesla from 2007. Um, Goodenough and his research group also invented the highly important lithium ion phosphate or LFP battery in 1996, which is now the basis for the Chinese battery bus industry and is likely to become standard in future utility and building stationary battery markets. Um, he, in 2017, he put forward a lithium metal glass electro electrolyte battery it can be re recycled at least 230,000 times, but nobody at the moment can figure out how it works or how it can be manufactured. Uh, but what a guy. There are a lot of different kinds of uh, lithium batteries and um, uh, it's, too long, it's not enough time to go through all these, but uh, there, it's just to let you know that uh, there is a great race down to a, a price, a magic price called $60 per kilowatt hour. I guess that's $60 American. And uh, that's the price at which uh, a lot of people believe that it will cost the same for 
an EV to be made as a, an internal combustion engine car. If that happens, then the EVs win because they are much cheaper to run. You'll see some red numbers in this slide. Um, uh, they're in dollars per kilowatt hour. Uh, so uh, you can compare the batteries uh, as they're coming. But the sodium ion battery just came in about three days ago at 70 kilowatt hour, $70 a kilowatt hour. And I expect uh, uh, that all of these batteries will be getting down to such figures fairly soon. There are currently two virtuoso uh, automobile companies uh, uh, specializing in battery cars. One is Tesla, based in America, and one is BYD, based in China, but they have factories in each other's countries. Um, uh, Tesla was marked, uh, founded by um, Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpenning, but uh, was uh, basically uh, taken over in 2008 by Elon Musk, although he was an early founder as well. Uh, and uh, if you look at the timeline uh, of this co uh, company in the slide, you can go to an early date, like uh, say 2012, when the Model S was launched and they were producing 2,650 2, cars. If you look in 2020, for example, half a million cars. Um, uh, if you look at the market cap of uh, Tesla in 2021, it's $658 billion. This company is a virtuoso company and produces a lot of different things and uh, is, is uh, very amazing in technical terms. Uh, BYD is the other market leader. Um, uh, started off as a rechargeable battery factory um, back in 2002 or so, uh, but uh, it uh, now is a, a leader in many industries and uh, manufactures cars and batteries. It's just come up with the Blade battery, which Tesla is interested in. And they're trialing the Blade battery on their own Model 2 small car, which isn't released yet. So uh, B BYD is a major bus maker and did a lot of early uh, buses, but now there are a number of China uh, Chinese companies doing that. Shenzhen uh, bought 16,300 electric buses and changed their entire fleet. And Sydney is going to uh, change to 8,000 electric buses. They've announced this. So um, uh, the web's, uh, web addresses for that is at the bottom of the slide if you want to find out about it. This is a quick uh, slide, I hope, uh, that will just uh, point out that trucks running batteries make sense. There's a lot of room to put put them in and um, uh, there's a, in this picture there are the Tesla Semi up in the right and a Volvo on the left top and uh, the one I like most is the garbage truck in the center which will be nice and quiet in the morning. Um, so there are big savings to diesel fuel you don't have to go there anymore the maintenance costs are about half that of a diesel truck there's no exhaust pollution there's much reduced noise and no waste fluids from maintenance and uh, electric trucks like uh, the Tesla can travel 600 kilometers before needing a recharge, uh, but um, um, that isn't necessary for a lot of other truck purposes. So this looks really good as a market. Uh, well, we're going into small vehicles now, more personalized ones. Uh, the, the, of course, the old one was the bicycle, and it's a lot of information in the picture on the right uh, from bicycleguider.com. Uh, showing how many bikes are in the world, and there are about a billion. Uh, it used to be the most common vehicle in the world, but uh, now, unfortunately, there are 1.5 billion cars. Um, so most of the bikes work uh, in as commuter bikes in Asia, and uh, you see how many are in China compared. About half are in, in China, and they're you know hardworking bikes. Um, uh, but um, uh, the advantage of bikes is that they're actually solar powered since your food energies come from solar power. Uh, mostly except, uh, as I say in the slide, maybe the coal powered artificially lit hydroponic lettuces don't count. Probably the, this is the only really dystopian future when you can't buy anything. Uh, you could still probably run a bike if you save the, uh, as I say, hoard some wheel bearings. 
Uh, electric bikes uh, go way back uh, to 1895, as we see, uh, but uh, also uh, uh, an important uh, advance was uh, that Yamaha invented the pedal assist system in 1993, which allowed a combination of human and pedal power. Uh, so the bikes are in two groups. Pedal X uh, are below 250 watts and you don't need a, a license or a helmet uh, in some countries. Uh, uh, and um, e-scooters need motorbikes, are more powerful and go on roads and uh, need to be licensed. Uh, the the uh, uh, step in, step through scooter, uh, there is an electric uh, scooter from Italy. Um, uh, the the one on the uh, upper, or sorry, the lower right is uh, a Harley electric, and the top right is a strange chair thing from Segway, but everything's strange from Segway. Um, this slide and the next one are uh, examples of a, a flood, uh, as I say, a Cambrian explosion of species. Uh, uh, which has occurred in small battery transporters, um, as they're called now. Um, uh, this slide shows self-balancing electric scooters and hoverboards on the left. Uh, uh, one has, uh, you have to hold it with your knees. Uh, there's a happy family on their hoverboards and uh, another sort of segue thing on the, where you stand up and hold it. Uh, on the right, uh, uh, there are, uh, scoot, just a couple of scooters. Uh, it's more or less the same, but I just like the pictures. And uh, um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much all of these things are going to do for um, the environment, but uh, they're obviously a lot of fun. So here are a few more examples from the zoo. Uh, Self-balancing skateboards, uh, you see up in the upper left. Um, uh, hover shoes, um, shoes you can, just one wheel underneath and you can zip along on those. And self-balancing unicycles where the fellow is clearly trying to take off. And then there's a lady doing a nice um, uh, sojourn along a country road on her unicycle. Um, ships cause about 1.7% of the emissions pie. Uh, uh, that's not very big, but they're also pretty efficient at transporting foreign species when they're not wanted and they regularly deposit crude oil and waste into the ocean. So reducing the number of vessels would be a biological and chemical plus. Um, about half the business of the uh, global fleet is carrying uh, energy or chemicals that we don't want in the future. So that by, by reducing that uh, need, um, the fleet will reduce probably by that factor, and that will cause uh, a reduction in the emissions. Um, but uh, we can go the, the whole way by making sure that the ships that are out there are using solar wind and hydrogen or ammonia for the fuel, and that would make really sense, a lot of sense if some of them are actually shipping those fuels internationally. I think it's possible to have direct wind and solar freighters, by the way, but I haven't seen a really good design appear yet. Um, current railways globally have comparatively little emissions. Uh, it's down at about the 0.5% level um, of the total emissions pie. Um, a good fast train like the Japanese or French trains and other Chinese trains can be a great way to travel and um, it can be green if the electricity is green. So that's all right, but fast trains are very expensive to construct and maintain. So uh, Elon Musk proposed the Hyperloop as a faster and a lower price alternative um, uh, with uh, sort of vehicles moving at airplane like speeds in a tube having a partial vacuum inside to stop air resistance. Um, actually, Elon didn't invent it. George Medhurst did in 1799, and it was called a back train. Um, Elon just reminded us about it. Uh, but uh, he gave it to the world to develop because he was too busy. Um, Maybe he's taking it back right now because he's formed the boring company and is putting in some lines to move uh, uh, cars around fast dug tunnels under LA and elsewhere at high speed. Hyperloop does actually offer a potential fast overland solution for long distance travel. Um, and that would avoid 
serious airline control warming issues, but it looks like uh, an ugly pipeline if it's done cheaply above ground as the uh, picture shows. Uh, so uh, underground will be more expensive, but it would be prettier. Uh, perhaps that won't matter. Well, this is about robo taxis. Um, uh, cars are, on average, idle about ninety-five percent of the time. This has been confirmed over and over, and it's uh, quite. Uh, uh, common around the world. If the car is shared, then the capital expended per passenger gets much smaller. If it runs without a driver, then the taxi fare is approximately halved. EV fuel, by the way, is electricity and very cheap. But traditional public transport does not take you to, door, to your door like a car. Uh, Elon Musk has been progressing his automated technology since 2012. It's meant to be a fast driverless Uber type service. Uh, he's still not there yet, but he's closer, and his competitors are getting closer too. This is a Zooks car, um, which you will call with an app and prepay as with the Uber. Uh, it has four seats, and you can share it, or else be safely alone. It's symmetrical, can drive away in either direction, and turn in a very tight turning circle. Zooks was bought by Amazon, just like Buffett bought BYD. With Zooks's and robo uh, Teslas out there, uh, doing overtime without a union and charging themselves at their inductive charges the rest of the time, it would be like the Parisian trains where one always comes in three minutes. Each will replace perhaps five ordinary cars and you can forget about having to find a park or dodging and seeing human drivers. You can just read emails or maybe play some speed chess with a Zuxi bot on the wall screen, or maybe just look out at the shop fronts and pedestrians walking streets clear of parked cars because nobody drives anymore. Well, the next few pages uh, speak to the problem of the 1.9% of emissions that are caused by flying above the planet. Jet planes have a real problem, especially the ones that fly high. Small soot particles from the jet engine exhaust will see the formation of water droplets from the humidity in the air, and those artificial clouds have been shown to trap heat in the atmosphere. The clouds reflect solar away during the day and keep us cooler, but also have a warming effect reflecting back infrared radiation radiated by the Earth. So in the day, these effects partially cancel each other out, but at night, there's no sun. So the only effect is that the cloud blanket is keeping heat from radiating away. And this is maybe enough to raise the night temperatures by three degrees C. Night temperatures dropped by 1.8 C during the Twin Towers aircraft grounding uh, because the skies were clear. Uh, we want that temperature to drop at night to keep us cooler. Some analysts believe that by 2050, about 25% of global CO2 emissions will come from av aviation alone. The solution is not to burn fossil fuels for aviation. Burning hydrogen or ammonia as a fuel does not produce CO2 or soot particles, but also battery aircraft simply have zero emissions. These are two aircraft designs used for, uh, or intended for regional use uh, uh, using vertical takeoff and landing. I'm showing them to you not uh, because I want to describe them. I don't. I don't think they should be done this way. Uh, um, but I wanted them put in so you could compare them with the next slide. No sound? <laughs> This is a, uh, a Lilium jet. It's a project and a startup 
uh, based in Munich, Germany. And uh, its purpose is to build an air shuttle to replace train and bus services. Uh, it, it means that literally replace. Uh, over inner city distances, it will be faster and cheaper than electric cars, which are already cheaper to run than um, internal combustion engine taxis. It's meant to operate inside cities, and uh, so it uses electric ducted fans with acoustic liners for low noise levels, so it can use the city landing pad. Uh, it reminds me of Tesla in, in many ways. The design premise is simplicity. There's no water cooling or liquid fuel. Um, the fans are integrated into the wing uh, to become part of the lifting surface. Uh, there are no air ailerons, uh, rudder flaps, or tail because the engine thrust vectoring does everything. Uh, has less drag than other designs, goes faster. Uh, it has a longer range. Um, it, it carries seven people um, because its ducted fans are 15 times smaller than an open propeller for a given weight, uh, and therefore you can make, have a heavier airplane. So uh, it's also pretty nice looking. If I could paraphrase uh, the CEO of Lilium, Daniel Weigand, or Weigand, I think it is. <laughs> uh, I would say that uh, the Lilium jet is light on the land because it is above the land. Uh, what he is trying to reduce is the infrastructure that we use for transport. So we build all these roads and lines uh, for um, cars and trains, and uh, uh, we forget about them once we built them, but they were uh, a major impact on the environment. He says, in his own words, uh, in uh, indirect comparison, uh, a train journey may be more, more energy efficient, but in terms of the overall energy balance, in view of the complex construction of the rail infrastructure, the electric aircraft is the most environmentally friendly means of transport apart from the bicycle. That sounds revolutionary to me. Well, this is uh, very interesting too. Uh, the Swedish ES-19 is uh, a new computer, uh, sorry, commuter aircraft designed to be a 19-seat uh, electric uh, short takeoff and landing aircraft, um, basically uh, an intercity commuter plane. Um, uh, it has a range of 400 kilometers uh, and uh, is smaller than normal commuter planes because the engines are much cheaper, uh, being fans, uh, electric fans, rather than uh, normal turbofans, uh, jet fans. So uh, uh, it, it's caused a big fuss. It's very interesting for people and uh, companies uh, think that this might be very low in cost to maintain and run. Uh, United Airlines and Maze Airlines have already ordered 100 uh, each to enter service uh, starting in 2026. But I think it will spawn a whole lot of other uh, aircraft uh, of uh, even longer range. So we're nearly done. Uh, just the final page. Uh, uh, first place. Uh, just about short-term solutions for big jets. It's a really difficult problem. Uh, it's not as difficult as longer term, but um, in both cases, uh, affording this conversation, condensa condensation is a, an issue. Uh, fuel substitution uh, might work if current engines can run from the fuel involved. Uh, a possible mix of ammonia and hydrogen has been suggested in the UK to emulate jet fuel. Um, I think that may not work. Uh, for uh, reasons of uh, the energy uh, stored in the fuel. But uh, if it does work, it uh, could take as long as 10 years to uh, get working. Um, we could adjust the flight path and altitude to minimize uh, condensation uh, from clouds. Uh, there are different conditions uh, in different places and you might be able to predict that. Uh, we could limit flying at night to allow contrail dissipation and cooling. Uh, that would mean people will have to fly during the day and not at night. Uh, for longer term solutions, uh, I think we need uh, new uh, battery aircraft of perhaps 1,000 kilometers of range over the next 10 years, and that may occur. Uh, what would be good for long distance is where land is uh, either a fresh, fast tra train crash program uh, with overnight travel, so you sleep uh, while the train is going, say, across the continent or uh, coast to coast sort of thing. Uh, at 400 kilometers an hour, you can 
um, imagine that might work. And uh, also fast, uh, like Elon Musk hyperloops uh, for longer overland travel at even higher speeds. Yeah. Uh, one of those two could work. Uh, the fast train would be more expensive probably. But if we're going to go over the oceans, we need a fully redesigned aircraft running from hydrogen or ammonia. And that could take 20, 25 years to make. They, they're not quick to make. Uh, so that's it. Uh, there are things we can do in the meantime. And uh, in fact, we can do most of it in the meantime while we're waiting for jets to solve the problems. Thanks for listening. I see everybody is applauding. Well, I've got my microphone on, so I will applaud. <laughs> That'll be the sound effect for, for all of us. David, that was a, a remarkable and a fascinating look at um, certainly past, present and future, as you say, on the planet, above the planet. And, and some of those ideas, I thought, were quite off the planet, although... <laughs> <laughs> um, now, that was just a couple of quick takeaways from me before we go to look at some of the, the questions. Yeah. Um, and um, I was struck actually looking at your history of, of, um, of electric vehicles in terms of conventional cars. And I think a lot of us were aware that they had actually been on the scene before petrol driven cars or certainly at around the same time. I was struck that the, um, um, the, 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 the Ford and Edison um, operations around the 1910s actually longer range than when things started re-emerging in the late 80s, we were looking at the ranges there. I don't know if that's simply because the speeds and so on were, um, you know, speed or something like that. But it, it's something that, that maybe we lost a skill and then had to redevelop it. Um, have you got any comment on that just before? We... No, not, not really. Uh, uh, the, I, I was surprised too. Uh, the, the range of our I-3 was about 110 kilometers and uh, the, the, the old Detroit was doing 130. Mm. So it didn't seem that we advanced very much, but they, it was very sedate. It didn't go very quickly. Uh, uh, I don't have an exact value, but it would be a very slow car today. Uh, so uh, um, that's it's, a, it's an important factor in your, uh, as, as we all know, in your uh, fuel consumption. So if you slow it down, it, it goes farther. Um, but um, yes, uh, uh, the, the, even though the um, uh, electric car lost out to the fuel car um, uh, in, in the 20s, uh, uh, it, was, it, it had many advantages for most people, but the range of the fuel cars was higher. Mm. And uh, so that was an important part. If you have a big country and you have uh, long roads between cities, uh, as, as they do in the United States, so it was a big selling point. Mostly the uh, EVs were used around the cities and uh, stayed close to a charging point. I suspect actually that, that those very low ranges in the 1990s were possibly what, what um, a lot of people got wind of and they haven't really updated their thinking since then because uh, the range anxiety is, is one of the... Uh, one of the big things that apparently are holding us back these days, particularly in Australia, from from uh, uh, from from taking up uh, EVs faster. Yes. Um, I've got a question here. Oh, I just wanted to comment, looking at the at your final slide. Um, oh, some of the some of the the flying machines um, looked quite like the sort of things we were seeing in science fiction stories fifty years ago. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's malevolent, malevolent to me, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's lots more to say, but we've got a question here that uh, Jean sent in a couple of days ago, actually. And, um, well, three questions, in fact. Um, looking at the, the prices of, and I don't know if you can comment on this at all, but looking at the prices of EVs now, which are quite high, um, and part of that in Australia is because uh, there's so few... And she's wondering what sort of sales we ought to expect would be needed for prices to come down to um, um, to where they're comparable with with um, with ICE vehicles. Um, a bit more, but but have a look at that one first. Yeah, it's to, it, um, the battery technology is changing rapidly, and that's uh, affecting not only the speed and range of vehicles, but the cost. 
uh, of the vehicle. It's getting lighter for the amount of energy stored in the battery uh, for a given range. And so uh, uh, that's one thing that'll improve things. And uh, that graph I was trying to show you, there was a race on, well, it, the race is nearly won. Uh, uh, it, it, we're nearly there, but even if you do get there, then you have to design a whole lot of vehicles and produce them uh, with com often completely different equipment, uh, maybe highly automated equipment these days. Uh, to um, uh, get them on market quickly enough. So all of the EVs that are being produced now uh, get sold right away. Uh, Ch China sold out of uh, Teslas until the third quarter of this year. Um, uh, I think they're, they're largely sold out in the United States for a few months too. So you, you, uh, you can't, it's, it's hard to get one because uh, uh, they're so desirable. Uh, um, and I think society's moved to that point where they understand the differences. And a lot of people would like one, but uh, they feel they can't afford it yet, but that, that price is dropping. You'll find that in the next few months, uh, uh, you'll find BYD cars coming in uh, in greater numbers and the lower cost models from China and uh, uh, quite, quite well built. Great. There's, there's several questions. I don't know if you can comment on these. Um, looking at the issues of um, where you get your EV charged, we seem to be focusing on the sort of here and now, the immediate... Um, challenges facing um, you know, any of us who might want to, to move over to EVs. So there's a question about um, um, solutions for households without driveways. Um, what about um, you know, people in apartment blocks? What about working with councils to put uh, charging stations in? Have you, have you had a look at that sort of that side of things? Uh, uh, not an intentional look, just an experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I've known the people that actually put them in the council park, parking lots. And there's one on top of Chatswood, for example, uh, which is a, a good EV parking and uh, charging place. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, I think that the, the experience of most EV people that own people that own EVs are uh, is that uh, you hardly ever charge up outside of home unless you, you are doing a long trip. Um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a Tesla, uh, you would re refill every uh, maybe 300 kilometers or 350 kilometers to be safe. Uh, it's supposed to be a bit, bit higher than that, but um, uh, and uh, there is a there is a refueling cost in time there because it's uh, getting faster all the time. Uh, I'd say in another year or two, it approaches the time that you just want to stop anyway. <laughs> Uh, being human, and uh, uh, so that, that's that's uh, that's all progressing quite quickly. Uh, but as far as the Tesla, which was a, a 2014 car, uh, uh, there's no range anxiety with it all. At all, uh, we have a house in Lura, and we go up there, and we can come back, and I can go up again and go back, and there's there's no problem. Uh, it 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 will go the distance. The little one is a different matter. Uh, it only barely makes it up the hill. <laughs> Okay, uh, um, just before another question, I uh, another thought I had looking at, at all of those um, smaller sort of commuter type um, flying things, I, somehow I, I, I got a vision of uh, sort of early 20th century um, uh, um, helium balloons or hydrogen balloons, even hot air balloons, whatever, um, and um, that maybe somebody else had the same thought because the question here is, with the recent battery fires, are we seeing history repeating? Um, so batteries, yeah. flammable batteries. Yes, um, there are two main groups of batteries at the moment, uh, but the, the, there are a whole lot of different types, but uh, the, the main battery in China is now the BYD uh, type battery, which, um, which is uh, called LFP. And um, uh, that's uh, the second one that Goodenough uh, produced first time. Uh, it uh, is pretty non-flammable. Uh, um, for example, I want to get a battery on our house uh, in Lura. That's where we have our, our, our weekend. Uh, but it's all wood. It's 1902 and it's made of, uh, entirely uh, of wood. So um, I don't want one of those batteries that can uh, burst into flame. They, they hardly ever uh, are dangerous because what they do is they're, they're slow it's a slow burn and uh, then they start getting more and more and then they, they just burn down. And in Tesla, if it feels anything's wrong, it, it, tells, it tells you on the screen, uh, uh, please pull over and get out of the car. 
so uh, it, it's a matter of losing uh, a piece of equipment and you can go back to the manufacturer and get a new one, really. And that's what, there were three initial fires in Tesla some time ago, but caused by stones uh, coming through insufficient uh, thickness on the bottom of the car. So they, they beefed that up subsequently. But the three, the three owners that lost their cars all bought a new one immediately uh, because they, it was the best car they'd ever owned. It just happened to burn down, that's all. <laughs> Thanks, David. Somebody's picked up on your, um, on your point about shipping and uh, they've said that you mentioned that half of the world's shipping is for, quote, the transport of chemicals we probably won't want in the future. Mm. They've asked what's transported by the other half. But uh, my question also is um, all those ships that we hope won't be carrying coal and oil in the future might well be carrying um, hydrogen or ammonia. Mm. Well, that's right. And that, so that, that possibly doesn't do much for the transport of... Uh, uh, animals to the wrong place, but uh, it it, uh, it does do something for at least uh, uh, carbon carbon emissions if you use ammonia or hydrogen fuel. Uh, so there's a, mm -hmm. uh, you know there are uh, Twiggy Forest and a whole bunch of other people in China. I said sorry in, in Australia, several projects uh, uh, somewhat impeded by the federal government, but um, uh, trying to get them out there where we, they want to produce hy hydrogen from. Uh, uh, wind and solar, and uh, that hydrogen would be used uh, as a, a feedstock for ammonia in many cases. And either one of hydrogen or ammonia can be used uh, theoretically in a plane uh, because they don't produce soot. They haven't got uh, carbon in them. And uh, so uh, they would solve that uh, problem in aircraft, but they can also be used for fuel in any other place like, a, like a, an, an aircraft. I saw like, like a, a chip, you know, it would just be something different from oil. So that would, that would green up uh, the, uh, the, the uh, pollution profile of the, of the ship, even if you didn't change the design, you just run that from, say, ammonia, which is great. Right. right. Okay. There are so many, so many options in, in, the, in the world you've opened up, aren't there? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, just, uh, and we are, the, the questions are sort of dotting about a little bit, and there's quite a few here, so I'm just taking them as they come up. That's all right. Um, so I'm, you're going to have to be a bit mentally agile and focus on different things. Yeah. Um, somebody has asked, um, what do you think are the best things that governments could do, particularly in Australia, I guess, to incentivize the take up of EVs? Uh, stop, stop trying to stop it. That would be good. <laughs> Um, but uh, also, uh, it, it's clear that incentive plans work. Uh, they worked in uh, a treat in Norway. Norway's got a, uh, a lot of EVs now. It's, it's, it's well ahead of anybody else. Certainly the majority of cars in Norway now are EVs. And uh, they had a, a, a strong um, support program, which they could afford because of the North Sea income, of course. But uh, 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 even if you give uh, fairly minor incentives, uh, perhaps uh, uh, get, get away some of the taxes, uh, that, that sort of thing. You can, you can get people moving faster on that. However, it, it's, to me, it's only a short-term thing because the price is just going to drop uh, uh, of all those vehicles. Uh, that, there's, there's a little car uh, from BYD that's out there. It'll probably come here and probably be about $25,000. Uh, but it, it, won't, it won't cost you, it, you, you'll have practically no running costs on the thing after you, after you get it, uh, and it uh, should last a, a very long time. Uh, one thing that hasn't been discussed or isn't where most people aren't aware of is that the cars being, the, the parts for the uh, engines and uh, the, the batteries are slowly being designed for very, very long range uh, uh, usage, or another, in other words, a, uh, the batteries being in, announced in uh, America by Tesla and also by uh, Cattle, it's a company, battery company in China. They're talking about a million kilometer range or two million kilometer range for the battery. Mm -hmm. In other words, you never, you, when you get the car, you don't change the battery. The, you know, the battery will uh, last probably longer than the car and you just repurpose the battery if you have to take apart the car for any reason or have an accident. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, these are, uh, it's, it's very different from the, the situation we have now. Uh, they're building parts that last also a million miles uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in America, um, especially the motor. Uh, and uh, the only 
they, they don't say why they're doing, but it's very clear that uh, this would be very good for cars being used as robo taxis. So uh, once once uh, the correct configuration comes through and the software finally works, <laughs> uh, then uh, 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 Tesla's there to convert all those all those uh, cars back to back probably ten years uh, uh, to uh, robo taxi. So if you if you want to make a little money at night, you can send your car off and it can go uh, patrol for uh, mm -hmm. people. Uh, and Tesla will mine the car in, in doing that. In other words, it will be controlling the car. So uh, uh, that that is a whole different world. Uh, it's democratizing public transport. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the, the uh, plane described, the Lilium, it's the same thing. It's democratizing this uh, thing or making uh, a, a distributed kind of system, uh, large scale system everywhere instead of big block systems. You know? And I think uh, uh, that that's what's really uh, going to change things for us. That's what's going to change the face of our lives. Hmm. Some, th there's um, something I'll, I'll come down to, but I just want to throw in this, this little comment before, um, I want to come back to something you said, David. Um, some of us might have seen a few weeks ago, I think it was, uh, they took a, um, a Tesla up to uh, Queensland somewhere, and I think it was Bob Catter. They put Bob Catter in the driver's seat and, uh, and uh, sent him off. And he was, wow, you know, this is fantastic. This is great, you know, because he put his foot down and it really took off, and he was really excited about it. Um, and somebody has suggested here, looking at the... Um, at the the, um, uh, the various electric uh, jet crafts that we saw, some which look more bizarre than others, they said perhaps Angus Taylor would like to do a test pilot run in one of those. Uh, yeah, he needs a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, no, yeah. so, so someone made the point that he he lives in the uh, electorate that has the most solar and most wind together. In well, the <laughs> <laughs> so that's his electorate. That, he, he hasn't got the message. He has the best uh, uh, provided electorate for uh, renewable energy. Actually, I think they were hoping he might come in for the off the planet category. But uh, um, the, the, there's another suggestion here, and we're running short on time now, but just briefly on this one, there's somebody is talking about the idea that um, um, car batteries might be able to double up as your domestic battery. So we might finish up with sort of a bi-directional battery operation so that you can drive your car during the day and it'll power your house at night. Yeah, it's a confused situation at the moment. So many things are happening at once. Uh, it hasn't really settled uh, yet on that. There, there is a movement and there has been for some time in Japan, but now it's uh, getting to other countries uh, where uh, uh, People think that naturally they would think a, a car a car battery must be smaller than a house battery, but actually a, a car battery is probably ten times the size of a, a house battery, or maybe at least eight. Uh, so uh, if you fill up a car and then there's an outage, in principle the car should be able to run your house uh, for several days, which is all you need, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and uh, that's going to be offered by a number of. Um, manufacturers uh, in the coming five years, I would say. Uh, their, their number going to be claiming this. Tesla hasn't gone for it. They, they are already selling house batteries and perhaps that interferes with their, their market on house batteries. But uh, we, have, we, have, we have house batteries uh, in uh, our house in Roseville. Um, and uh, they're very reliable. And uh, what they do is they just cut off the peak power requirements in, in the most priciest part of the day. And, uh, and they're uh, they work very well. Um, Derek has actually raised a point, um, which I know he's raised before. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think you've probably got solar panels on your roof, haven't you, David? But uh, oh, we have indeed. Yes, I'd be surprised otherwise. <laughs> Derek, Derek worries about the time of day that we choose for charging. He points out that um, charging at night would prop up fossil fuel, because that's the dominant supply when the sun ain't shining. Um, so it needs to be easy for people to charge at commuter car parks and uh, the workplaces and so on during the day. Mm. It's hard, hard to say. It depends whether your car is, I mean, uh, if we've got 95% of cars uh, at home or, well, they're stationary. That's, that's what that statistic was. They're stationary. So they can be stationary at a computer, at a car park or something like that. 
Um, uh, yes, um, if there's some good, good purpose for it, uh, but uh, uh, the inclination is not to pay for it if you've already got the um, capital invested in your home installation and it's got the energy and uh, uh, you can park it at the car, the car at there at a certain time of day, sometime during the week or on the weekend, uh, um, then you don't, it's not like the old days where you had to refill every day. Uh, charge up every day. Uh, I, I charge my car about once a week. I can choose the time of the week to do it. If I wanted to do it on the weekend, I can do it on the weekend and in the daytime. And there are also better chargers now that are coming out and uh, allowing the car to uh, plug in. And then if there's a solar array going on that, that, that day and uh, uh, that's producing too much power, and that happens quite often, uh, you normally put it back in the grid, but this will switch it over to your car and your car will charge just with the excess as it, as it happens. And uh, that that's, um, is, is very attractive uh, uh, possibility for, for, day, for daytime charging. But um, uh, ultimately, uh, as we get more and more generation uh, with its own storage in, then the, uh, the, the high coal fraction that we have at night will, will reduce. I mean, coal, coal plants are are going down. Mm. Mm. Um, look, we are running very short of time, so I think that's probably, and there are some more questions in the in the column here. I'm sorry that we just can't get to everything, uh, but we have we have covered an awful lot. David, you have you have given us a probably a century looking back and and possibly half a century looking forward mm. of, of the whole prospect for for clean transport. I think. Um, the world that you've described, the universe that you've described, goes a whole lot wider than the question of where do I plug in my electric car today. Um, and and that I uh, thank you for that very much. It's a fascinating look at, at what could revolutionise of everything. Um, so whilst you are all um, mute, can we have another sort of? Thank you very much. All round today. Um, I did just want to mention that in this last slide. Um, he was talking about a fast train crash program, and I was a little bit worried yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but in the absence of fast train crashes, um, look, that's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, and we hope we will see you all next time. Thanks a lot, everybody.